This is a review of the 2008 film Pontypool. Since this video is being uploaded in October, which is usually when people love to watch horror films, I decided that I would be doing a review on one of my favorite horror films of all time. My suggestion is that you, if you have not seen the film, that you stop listening to what I'm saying and that you watch it. Because, unfortunately, there's, there's no other way to talk about this film except for me to ruin a few aspects of it. So if you sort of want to be genuinely surprised by the movie, I would suggest that you watch it first and then listen to this. Because in certain ways, I think this uh, review is for those that have seen the film. At least if you've seen the film, nothing is to be spoiled. But I can't help but spoil certain things, especially in the part when I talk about why I find the film compelling. So to start with, some basic facts about the film that I think are relevant. It is a Canadian horror film. It was filmed in Canada, and I know at least the director and the main actor, they're both Canadian too. What's also interesting about this film, in terms of its basic facts, is that both the novel and the screenplay are written by the same person. Tony Burgess. I think that's interesting to note because one issue that comes up in screenplays that are adapted from novels is that if there's two different authors, then you, you run into the problem, I think, that a lot of people have with when it's their favorite book or they really liked the book and then they go see the film and they're like, it was nothing like the book and the book is way better. I, I think part of that issue is that, well, the person who came up with the plot, uh, that came up with the characters, Right, that sort of gave this gave life uh, to that universe within the story. It's not the same person who's then trying to give life to that in the film. So it's safe to say that since Tony Burgess wrote the screenplay, that he had a level of creative control then in terms of what of what we're seeing in the film. I really want to read the novel now after watching the film uh, because the film is very well written. One thing to note, too, is that Tony Burgess wrote uh, the screenplay for this, is that it was simultaneously produced as a motion, motion picture and a radio play. This was sort of influenced by the infamous radio broadcast of Orson Welles' The War of the Worlds. For those of you that don't know what's being referred to there, the radio play, it was, it was, it was broadcast, and people actually thought that it, they didn't realize it was a story being told over the air. And people started to freak out like they thought that actual aliens were taking over. And it wasn't until the end they learned, oh, that was just a story. Definitely because the, the plot takes place in a radio station. I think that's also relevant. In terms of reception, this film did rather well. It, it's got a 6.7 on IMDb, a Metascore of 54 by Metacritic. And on Rotten Tomatoes, it's 83%. So I think the film was, was well received. Uh, it used to be that you could watch this on Netflix, and it was up on there for the longest, and it no longer is, so you'd have to procure the film by other means. The film opens in the small town of Pontypool in the province of Ontario, where we find former shock jock turned radio announcer Grant Mazzy. He's driving through a blizzard to work. On the way... Mazzy has a strange encounter with a nonsensical woman who gets his attention by putting her hand on his car window and only saying the word blood, 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 before staggering off into the storm. He arrives at work at the radio station, where he works with a technical assistant, Laurel Ann Drummond, who's recently served in Afghanistan, and his station manager, Sidney Breyer who's recently divorced. That's sort of what we... These characters never really filled out too much uh, beyond that. But, you you know, as you watch the film, you'd see why this kind of basic description of the three of them plays a part in sort of what we see in the characters as the plot unfolds. The morning unfolds, and he's sort of telling the news of the day and stuff. They start getting these reports of people exhibiting weird, unusual behavior. And since this is a small town, the idea is that, you know, nothing really weird or unusual happens here. Grant Mazzy and uh, Laurel Ann Drummond and Cindy Breyer, they're all sort of 
they're a bit uh, unnerved, like what you know, what's happening. Things then really take a turn when their helicopter reporter Ken Loney he calls in. He's describing what looks like a riot at the office of a Dr. Mendez. And he, he's describing the scene of chaos, which turns into carnage. And he witnesses numerous people die. At the same time, French-Canadian troops have arrived, I guess, to sort of contain the situation. Ken is then unexpectedly cut off. And the rest of the folks in the radio station, right, they're trying to confirm what is, in fact, going on. They line up uh, several witnesses who are going to give their testimony over the air, but each of them becomes disconnected and, and weirdly so. So this, of course, is, is sort of it's dialing up the suspense there, you know, what's now happening. And now audibly frightened Ken, he calls back and he says that he's now taken refuge in a grain silo. And he starts to describe what he sees outside as people eating their way inside others and tearing themselves apart. An infected man sort of barges into the silo and crippling himself in doing so. Ken's call is then interrupted by a military transmission that's in French. Laureland translates the transmission, which is an instruction to remain indoors, refrain from interacting with close members, and not to use terms of endearment, baby talk, rhetorical discourse, or the entire English language. Pontypool is declared to be under quarantine. They're able to get Ken back on the phone, and he gets his phone close enough to the infected man for Grant, Laurel Ann, and Sydney to be able to hear his mumbling. All they hear is him saying, Mommy, in a child's voice. In confusion and disbelief, Grant storms out of the station, only to find a horde of people are on their way to attack the station. And at this point, Grant, Sydney, and Laurel Ann, they lock themselves in. Then it's clear that the, the virus is, is starting to hit home in the station and that Laurel Land is infected. And she starts just repeating the word missing and then imitates the sound of a tea kettle. At this time, out of nowhere, Dr. Mendez, right, the guy who's at the center of that riot, he sort of is able to, uh, through the basement window, uh, get inside the radio station. Dr. Mendez and Grant and Sydney, they all lock themselves in Grant's uh, soundproof booth, which seems to provide some relief. There, Mendez, he starts to explain how people are infected with a virus that's spreading through language. And I'm going to leave the plot there. I think hopefully that's enough for you to, if you haven't seen the film and didn't heed my advice, that now you're definitely intrigued. Why I find this film compelling is for a few reasons. I think unlike a lot of horror films that are made now where there's a lot of uh, blood and guts and just uh, over-the-top grotesque violence, this film is very much lacking in all of that. Um, there are a couple of scenes of blood, but nothing like what we're used to seeing in a lot of horror films that now come out. This film reminds me a lot of, uh, if you've seen Alfred Hitchcock, horror suspense films, in that there's this sort of slowly developing, not too slow, but this sort of slowly unfolding plot where with each scene the suspense grows and grows where the horror for the audience is not caused by what we do know, right? By the things we would see, like in other horror films. But the horror is in part from having the same limited perspective as the main characters, right? They're in a radio station, no clear knowledge of what's happening in the town outside, right? They're just getting these bits of pieces of information, and that's all we have. There's a certain element of, uh, you know, of horror that comes from this kind of mystery and suspense of not knowing what's really happening, right? In this sense, the audience is just as disoriented as the main characters. We're only getting more slowly oriented as they do. And in this sense, as the audience, we're in the same position of powerlessness uh, as the main characters. 
which is a contrast to slasher films where we do get the perspective of the slasher killer, right? We get, we're able to see things from their perspective, right? Using that cat and mouse game that is in slasher films is sort of, you know, you'll get the scene where you see the, the main characters, you know, trying to flee or hide or something. And then it bounces to then the perspective of the killer. And so in a certain way, right, the audience has this privileged perspective of, you know, we see from the, you know, from this outside, all of what's going on inside. In Pontypool, you don't have that. You don't have the other side of what's going on. In that sense, too, it's a bit Alfred Hitchcock-esque. If you've ever seen his film Rear Window or Rope, they're all filmed within, you know, one room. And essentially, that's what's going on too in Pontypool. I mean, the, it's only the opening sequence where we see him driving to work. And that's the only scene that takes place out of the side of the radio station. But everything is inside that, that main room and the sound booth, which is then a smaller room in that. And being like that too, much like movies like Weir Window and Rope, they are, this movie is very much dialogue-driven. The writing is... Is, is great. I know, you know, some of you might think, oh, you don't really like dialogue driven films, but no, I mean, this, it's, the dialogue is never boring or slow or anything like that. You, this is very much a film where you're, you're, you're on the edge of your seat through most of it. Now, one thing that comes up with this film, if you were to look it up uh, or talk to anybody who's seen it, is that it gets classified as sort of a, a zombie horror film. I mean, I think there's good reasons for thinking of it like that, for sure. One thing I want to note is that the director of the film, Bruce McDonald, at a film festival where this was featured, he didn't want them to be called zombies, the people that were infected. Um, instead, he calls them uh, conversationalists. This is the way McDonald described what's going on with the infected people. This is a direct quote from him. There are three stages to this virus. The first stage is you might begin to repeat a word. We saw that with Laurel Land and the word missing. We saw that with the woman uh, in the beginning where she's repeating blood or uh, the guy that's in the, the grain silo with Ken Loney repeating the word mother. That's right. That's the first stage is that you repeat a word and something gets stuck. Um, so this is going back to the quote from McDonald. The first stage, you might begin to repeat a word. Something gets stuck. And usually it's words that are terms of endearment like sweetheart or honey. The second stage is your language becomes scrambled and you can't express yourself properly. The third stage, you become so distraught at your condition that the only way out of the situation you feel as an infected person is to try to chew your way through the mouth of another person. I can tell you that in the film, we, I, I, don't, I don't recall an actual scene where we see someone chewing off somebody other, uh, someone else's mouth. But we do see, we do see Laurel Ann die, and definitely her, her, there's blood all over her face. So maybe that's what she was attempting to do. But when you see the people who are infected, they do in their behavior and the fact that they're sort of all, you know, A, they're trying to consume other people, right? That's one of the necessary conditions to be considered a zombie, is that you're trying to consume other humans in a, in a literal way. This idea, too, that sort of your ability to think about things or to, to, or to sort of act on your own volition is gone. And you kind of see that with these people, that, you know, they're not, it doesn't seem they're in control of their behavior. So I get the sense in which there, there are strong resemblances between what McDonald is calling conversationalists and zombies. What I think is interesting, if we do take the idea or, the, or these parallels with the conversationalists being zombies, is that it, the movie brings us back to the original sense in which, or the original sort of metaphors that, that zombies were meant to portray. All right, George Romero has made it clear that he sees zombie films, in particular his own, as being critiques of capitalist consumerism. And entailed within that is sort of this critique of mass society, right? The way, you know, that when we're sort of all acting in very similar ways that, you know, we've been zombified, so to speak. 
right? And that zombies in these films are just a literal portrayal of what already is metaphorically happening in our society. And these kinds of movies are meant to provoke thought about that. And I think this movie does that and is able to do that by sort of language being the virus and being the way in which it's spread. And especially the things that are being targeted here, things like terms of endearment, those are the things that, you know, we, we say over and over and over in a sort of zombified way. So this idea that sort of repeating cultural idioms and other common phrases, that's, what, that's what's zombifying us. This way in which common phrases and social conventions, the scripted interactions of small talk, these are the ways in which we're becoming infected. And that these sorts of things that, you know, there's nothing creative or really meaningful in these kinds of interactions. They're just things you do because that's what you're supposed to do in these situations. Say terms like honey or sweetheart or how's your day? I'm fine. Those kinds of things. And there's sort of emptiness that comes with that and the lack of more depth or meaningfulness in our interactions. What's interesting too, and this is for sure the biggest spoiler I'm offering here, is the cure, right, that we see in the film to this uh, zombification by language, by common idioms, is the creative use of language, creating new meanings for words, that that becomes the cure, that becomes the, the immunity against being infected by the virus. You will especially see this, uh, there is a, if you watch the film, make sure that you continue through the credits because there is a final scene. Apparently in the first version of the film, when they were playing it at film festivals, that the scene that's after the credits was actually the final scene, but it really threw people off. But what you'll see is that both um, the two main characters, Sidney Breyer and Grant Mazzy, that they are sort of, uh, they're very much talking metaphorically and making up names for themselves and, and just being very creative in their use of language. And so I think that's an interesting point too, that sort of them just playing with language, making it their own and using it to capture their own sense of things, that that's what, that's what uh, keeps them from being taken over by the virus. It's a great horror film. If you're looking, if you're someone who feels like horror films are just the same now, it's just the same idea be repeated over and over. Of course, nothing is truly unique and in original these days, but this is definitely refreshing and will sort of remind you of what it is you love about the horror genre. So if you're looking to be scared, this is a great one to watch.